science. They say, you know, well, creationists inhibit, you know, they just say God did it and that's it. Well, you know, no, we don't, first of all. But second, I mean, that's really sad because that's really inhibiting science to say, well, I don't think it has a function because of my evolutionary presupposition, so I'm not even going to look at it. I think it has a function because it's the result of an intelligent designer. So what we're seeing here is a lot of what we call discontinuity. We're seeing that each thing was designed specifically, and it's designed for a purpose, and what it does do, it does do well, okay? Um, it's not one thing evolved from the other. And not only do we see this in the genome sizes and the number of genes and things like that, we also see this in the junk DNA. Now, I said before, about 2% of our DNA codes for protein. So what does the other 98% do? Okay, now for years and years and years, this has been called junk DNA. Uh, it was first coined the term back in 1972 by a geneticist who had this to say about junk DNA. The earth is strewn with fossil remains of extinct species. Is it a wonder that our genes Genome 2 is filled with the remains of extinct genes. So basically, as you go from a bacteria to a human being, well, you expect some things to, you know, not be really needed by a human being or the next organism up the ladder. So it just sort of stays there and, you know, it doesn't really do anything anymore. It gets mutations and it's just a leftover, an evolutionary leftover. Okay, so here's the thing. Is junk DNA really junk? Now, some exciting new results recently came out from a project called ENCODE, which stands for the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And what they did was they studied 1% of the human genome. Okay, I want you to keep that in mind. 1%. And what they're studying is the junk. Okay? They're studying the stuff in between. And here's a quote saying what they found. We are now seeing the majority of the rest of the genome is active to some extent. There are, there, I don't know how many papers they published in, in relationship to this, just telling us what they think 1% of it does, okay? 1%. Now they're really excited. They want to study the other 99% because it, guess what? It does something. <laughs> it's functional. Uh, it has a role. Some of it may actually be transcribed and translated into proteins. They didn't think this before. They think it's added on to the stuff that comes from our genes. It's added on to proteins. Some of it's involved in how the DNA winds up and ends up in the nucleus. Some of it's involved in regulating how we go from DNA to RNA. Some of it's involved in replicating the DNA. I mean, just function after function after function. Some of it, they still don't know what it does, but they're pretty sure it's important. Now, so we would expect this. As creationists, this is like, yes, okay? This is what we've been saying all along. Uh, we would expect this. Now, here's the thing. If this junk DNA is functional, then one would expect it to be conserved across species that are evolutionary related. Like if you look at all mammals, you would expect, since you know, they supposedly they came from a common ancestor, that they would all have very similar junk DNA. Okay, let's see if that's what they actually found because they did some studies on this. Now, we're going to look at this using a completely fictitious sequence because in the papers themselves, they don't publish actual sequences that they, that they actually looked at uh, for this, and they don't specifically name the mammals that they studied. But they do talk about this in relationship to mammals specifically. But, but let's look at this, and I want to illustrate to you what the finding was. Is junk DNA conserved? So let's look at a whale, a mouse, a cat, a dog, a chimp and a human. Hey. So what did they find? Well, when they looked at the same portion of, ge of the genome and all of these organisms, and they looked at the junk DNA that's now considered to have some sort of function, they found that 50% of it was indeed conserved. 50% of those elements were conserved. And I kind of illustrate that here. Those in yellow kind of show you that if you looked at all of those genomes in basically the same approximate location, um, the junk DNA would be very, very similar 50% of the time. Say, so if 50% is conserved, what does that mean about the other 50%? It's not. They don't like this. <laughs> and it's really interesting when you read the papers. You can just tell they're having a really hard time with this. And in fact, the main paper on this particular project that came out was in um, the magazine called Nature. And at the very end, they said the most surprising result of this study was that, in other words, 50% of it's not conserved. That's the most surprising 
thing to them. They don't like it. They don't know how to deal with it. And for a creationist, you know, it makes total sense. It shows discontinuity between the organisms. You know, they always talk about how, you know, chimps and human DNA is so similar. Well, a lot of that is in the genes, and you would expect the genes to be similar. You know, we also have 50% similarity to a banana, okay? But no one thinks we're evolutionary related to a banana. Um, you would expect it. If you want to do a certain function in a chimp and a human, and it's the same function, it makes sense to use the same protein, okay? But where the differences might lie is how much, when, where, the regulation of it, maybe adding bits and pieces to it. And so that's what's in the junk, quote unquote, okay? That makes sense. That's what we would expect. 